And we are live. I see Dan is here. Hello, everyone. So Dan, with your permission, I'll start the webinar to allow attendees in. You're muted, Dan. <clears throat> I said proceed, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we'll start to see some attendees show. Do we have our guests? Uh, Julie and Christine are both here. Mm -hmm. I believe, Julie, Christine, are we waiting for one more? We have a few more folks that may pop on, but we have a, a, a quorum to start among the EDC folks. Oh. Okay. Rad, Raddy will be joining momentarily, but we, can, we can start whenever you're ready. Dan, whenever you're ready to start, Natasha is going to call roll tonight. Okay. Well, let's let, well, let's start with a roll call. Tosh, Tosh, okay. whatever you want. Thanks. Okay, no problem. For uh, economic development waterfront committee members, when you hear me call your name, please unmute yourself and just announce that you're here. Dan Murphy. Present. Thank you. Nicholas Azadian. Present. Thank you. Joan Body. Here. Thank you. Jalixa Camposano. Justin Collins. David Estrada. Cynthia Gonzalez. Here. Thank you. Hector Gonzalez. Beverly Kleiman. Antoinette Martinez. Marilyn Melman, everyone please stay muted until I call your name. Brett Mons, Crystal Rivera, John Santori. Present. Thank you. Cynthia Vandenbosch. Present. Thank you. Katie Walsh. Fred Wolf. Okay, that's the roll call for the committee. Natasha, I have three uh, board members who are not committee members who are in attendance. I have Cynthia Felix, Patricia Ruiz, and uh, Nicole Huang. Thank you. And John DeLuper now. Thank you. All right, let's get this party started. Everyone's doing well. It's a little muggy, but uh, it'll be cool off soon, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, starting to talk about uh, what's going to go on in the future. And uh, happy solstice, by the way, everybody. Um, happy summer, and uh, we are here at the at the committee for June uh, to to hear from EDC. Uh, about the uh, what's going to go on, uh, what the plans are for the north end of the Bush Terminal campus, also known as the Maiden New York campus, um, and to uh, take questions from committee members and uh, and everyone else who has attended the meeting. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about uh, the plans and updates on the on the on the plans and any RFPs and RFQs or anything else that's going out. Uh, in the future that EDC is putting out. For those of you who don't know, uh, Bush Terminal or Made New York Campus uh, is the uh, waterfront property between First Avenue and the water, uh, the New York Bay, uh, roughly between around 41st Street to 
I would say. Rodney, what is it? 52nd? 52nd. Okay. Did you say something? Well, yes, 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 52nd. Okay. <laughs> um, so we're, uh, we're going to go, I'm going to go right to you, Julie, and you can introduce your team and then go into the presentation and then we'll have Q&A. Fantastic. That sounds perfect. Um, I'm going to share my screen and you guys can just confirm you can see the title slide. Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so before we start, I just wanted to thank Community Board 7 Economic Development Waterfront Committee for inviting us here tonight. Dan had reached out um, about a month ago to um, ask us for an update broadly on what's happening at the Bush Terminal Campus, North Campus specifically. If you'll recall, we were back here in November to talk about what's happening at the South Campus with Steiner Studios. So we're happy to come and talk about what's happening to the North. Um, we will give you updates tonight on a number of projects that um, folks are aware of and give you some status updates and then also um, uh, share some information about some new projects that are on the horizon. Um, so before we get started, I just want to introduce some of my colleagues, and I suppose I should introduce myself, although I feel like I know you all well at this point. I'm Julie Stein. I'm a senior vice president uh, at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. I sit in our asset management group, and I'm co-head of our portfolio management team. Um, I also previously was the executive director of Sunset Park for, uh, for our asset management group, um, and we are joined here today with several of my colleagues, uh, including Christine Palagalunga, who is the, currently the executive director of Sunset Park for for EDC, as well as FC Hiathamopoulos, who is on her team, um, here also with Raddy Miranda on our government and community relations team, and maybe joined later by Justin Turner, also on our government and community relations team. So I think that rounds out the EDC folks that are here. Um, and I am going to dive in as long as, Dan, that's okay with you if I just uh, start. Sure, proceed. Great. Um, so I'm going to show you a few slides that I think a lot of folks on this call are familiar with, but in case there's anyone new here, just want to give you context. Um, I think many of you are familiar with uh, EDC more generally, but just as a reminder, we are a nonprofit um, that has a board made up of appointees by the mayor's office, as well as other elected officials and other ex officio um, folks across the city. We, on our asset management team, oversee 66 million square feet of real estate on behalf of the city of New York. We are a mission-driven landlord, which means that um, you know, we have to be good stewards of our assets on behalf of the taxpayer, but can also make other decisions that are policy-based to advance other goals of the city. We have uh, quite a few properties uh, in Sunset Park that we um, that we manage again on behalf of the city, and that has been happening uh, for I mean, for various decades. Uh, some of some are older and some are newer. Uh, it's also worth noting that um, a couple of years ago, right around 2015, uh, EDC's uh, relationship with our Sunset Park properties and our Sunset Park neighbors was um, fundamentally transformed uh, at the request of Councilmember Menchaca, who um, sort of had us commit to a number of different things. And so the team that you see here today is an evolution of. Um, sort of that expanded commitment to being good neighbors and being more um, mission driven and strategic in our sense of park assets. So uh, again, a lot of this is stuff that you know, but in case you're new, that's who we are. Um, and I'm just gonna run through the sort of our, our biggest properties in Sunset Park. Um, and then we'll dive into the Bush Terminal stuff specifically. So starting at the South, which is the left of the page, the Brooklyn Army Terminal, which many of you are likely familiar with. It's the property that's been in our portfolio for the longest um, since uh, mid-1980s. We also have the Brooklyn Wholesale Meat Market, which is a food distribution uh, facility. Then to the north of that is the Made in New York Campus at Bush Terminal, which will be the focus of our conversation today. To the north of that is the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, uh, which we've also been here recently to discuss. And this was the future home of offshore wind, staging installation, operation and maintenance, and uh, electricity infrastructure infrastructure, which we are super excited about. And then there are a couple other properties to the north that we also are the landlords for. So um, asphalt and concrete plants, uh, as well as Sims Municipal Recycling and, and a few others. So that's in a broad, a broad, broad strokes, uh, our portfolio. And then just as a reminder, we manage these properties strategically under a couple of different frameworks, but mostly as industrial anchors for uh, the, the maritime industrial waterfront. So especially when we're talking about the, um, the Brooklyn Army Terminal, the meat market and Bush Terminal, 
we are focused on what we call our core four tenanting strategy, which is traditional manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, food manufacturing, and then what we call made in New York, which is our sort of umbrella term for garment manufacturing, as well as film, TV, and media production. So each of the different properties has sort of different weights and then and, and different balances among these things. But generally, as we proceed, um, we are looking to be industrial anchors along, along the waterfront and promote um, manufacturing and production uh, in New York City. The other really important thing aligned with the Communities 197A plan is that as we um, develop and redevelop these properties, thinking about how to create additional public access to the waterfront. So if you've been down to the Brooklyn Army Terminal since 2018, you'll see all of this public open space. I always like to tell the anecdote that like on my third day of the job, I had to tell all of our uh, our, our tenants at, at the Army Terminal, they were losing their executive parking. That was a super fun way to introduce myself, but it has really borne fruit. Um, and if you have been down to the waterfront, you know what a, how beautiful that open space is. You'll see similar improvements that are happening at the at Bush Terminal, uh, which we'll go through a little bit later. So that is my uh, high level introduction. Now we're going to dive into Bush Terminal. Um, so again, we were here in November with Steiner Studios to talk um, about the South Campus, which is what's outlined here in red. Today, we're gonna be talking about um, the buildings that are the cluster of what we call the North Campus. Um, two, one major distinction between the South Campus and the North Campus, just in terms of the way we interact with it is the South Campus now um, is under, it will be under ground lease with Steiner Studios, which means they will be developing and operating the entirety of that red area. Um, as well as, as, as you know, the, the rail yard that's adjacent is, is operated by the Port Authority. So those are things that um, we sort of have folks in place that are doing the, the operations. The North Campus is a multi-tenanted campus, which means that EDC is responsible for the design and construction ourselves. And we hold multiple agreements with multiple tenants across all those buildings. Um, so the, the flavors of them are a little bit different. Um, and you'll see what I mean when we dive in. Um, so again, as many of you are familiar, um, we started talking about the Bush Terminal being called the Made in New York Campus since 2017. Um, you, so, so some of you may, may be confused by this as well, but or have been confused over time. Bush Terminal is the name that comprises, you know, the historic our, our Bush Terminal as well as Industry City. So we are moving sort of in a new naming direction just to eliminate that type of confusion. But for right now, we still call it the Made in New York Campus at, at Bush Terminal. The mayor announced in 2017 a co-location of several different uh, related uses, including a dedicated garment manufacturing hub, light manufacturing, film, TV, media, and sound stage development, as well as public realm improvements. And so all of the updates you'll see today are sort of all component parts of this um, of this overall strategy and that, that is um, coming into fruition now. So here's just a, a zoomed in overview of the property uh, of the North Campus. You'll see I left a little bit of the South Campus in there just for perspective. And we will spend um, uh, the rest of tonight talking about a deep dive on uh, most of these projects. Um, and then I will take questions at the end. So the various project components, as I mentioned, are the major renovations to create a garment manufacturing hub. Um, which is what we call Unit A. We're also upgrading um, space in, in a light manufacturing building uh, uh, to create, uh, to improve the um, overall site plan of the campus, as well as make improvements to that building itself. We are doing um, significant streetscape improvement and creating new public plazas to complement the Bush Terminal Pierce Park to the south, as well as create additional waterfront access. Um, again, a la the request of the 197A plan and what we've done at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Tonight, there's two new projects we're gonna be talking about. One is a lease to Eastern Effects and, and they're here joining us today and, and we'll get a chance to introduce you to them in a sec. Um, we're also gonna talk about Pier 6 and some funding that we have to do that rehabilitation uh, as an amenity for the campus. At the end, I'll also go through um, the remaining North Campus sites, some of which are tenanted and will be status quo, some of which are vacant and have no specific plans, but we anticipate being part of a future uh, phase. All right, so let's dive in. Some of the, these are going to be renderings that uh, you probably have seen before, but we do have some in progress construction photos um, and I tried to include a little uh, campus map to orient yourself, although I know it's a lot so at the end we'll come back to a map overall so we can have a discussion. Um, so this is uh, the rendering of the garment hub um, if you're familiar with this building it used to be white. They are making some sort of surgical uh, upgrades to the building facade, although. Uh, 
for the most part, leaving the building intact. Um, and as you see on the on the key on the bottom, this is the northwest building um, that sort of aligns between 41st and 42nd Street. Um, these, this is the building that has, is currently under construction, um, and we'll get to the overall timeline at the end of this section. Um, so this is some um, imaging of the of the scaffolding that was put up uh, first, and some of the uh, paint removal that has been completed. I know Jeremy has been in touch with me today. There was some incoming information about um, a request for information about what the safety protocols that were in place for that paint removal. So that is something that also came across our desk today. I'll circle back with. Jeremy when we have more information, but we have every reason to believe it's being done under the proper protocols, but we will circle back um, once we have more information about that. This is some photos of um, an in, some of the interior work that's being done, um, some of the uh, reinforcements that's being done uh, uh, on the grade beam uh, at, on two different elevations, the south elevation and the east elevation. Uh, and this is some other photos of some of the interior work, upgrading of building systems, um, as well as some of the trenches that are being dug for other infrastructure in the building. Um, this, uh, you, you'll see a theme tonight, which is that uh, we had been hoping to be further along in a lot of this and then had obviously paused for some time related to uh, COVID restrictions, um, but now we are back and in construction. And again, I'll talk about the over time, overall timeline at the end. Um, but we're excited that this building is under construction. The, the building itself has, is beautiful and has great bones. And so we're looking forward to the team that's doing that work. Uh, the other thing about the Garment Hub to note is that we released a request for expressions of interest in November of 2019 in order to find a partner for um, to take some to take some space that would be related to um, research and development as well as workforce training. Uh, we are uh, that is an ongoing negotiation process with a selection uh, expected later this calendar year. But we are really excited about the quality um, and the caliber of the. Um, proposals that we've gotten in. And so we are really excited about those how those negotiations are going. Uh, the idea here is that we would have, um, you know, the, 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 the Garment Hub itself will house between 20, I think between 20 and 25 businesses overall. Um, it will be a variety of small um, garment manufacturers, contract manufacturers, prototype uh, designers, uh, and that we also want to make sure that there is an, an R&D component as well as a workforce training component. So. That's what we're looking towards. We haven't announced any of the tenants here yet, but I can I can say that um, the the first deals that we are in the process of finalizing are all um, tenants that are located uh, are coming from other places within South Brooklyn. So these these are Brooklyn based businesses um, that are along the lines of what I was mentioning: garment manufacturing, uh, contract manufacturing, etc. Um, moving on to building C, which is one of the buildings that's getting upgrades for just um, sort of a, other light manufacturing. This could be garment, this could be other types of light manufacturing, but um, the, the building is getting certain upgrades in order to accommodate um, better building infrastructure, some changes to um, the building layouts on the ground floor to change where the trucks are going and create safer pedestrian um, passage to Bush and Clears Park. Um, this uh, project is not yet under construction, so we don't have any impact construction photos, but this is one of the renderings just to give you a sense of what the building's going to look like. Um, again, this is probably something you've seen before. This is the overall um, areas of concentration, if you will, of the different streetscape, streetscape upgrades. Um, there's four main areas that are going to be improved as part of our public realm. One is the waterfront, um, two is sort of a pedestrianized area between the cafe building and the administration building. If you're currently familiar with the path as you walk to the park, uh, you know that that pathway runs alongside the um, where the cars go, we are reconfiguring where that um, the vehicular traffic is going to go. So we're going to, sorry, a lot of dings and stuff <laughs> on my side. Um, uh, uh, that area is going to be pedestrianized um, and there's going to be some more public plaza space there, which we're really excited about. Um, and then we have what's called the core plaza area, which is um, which is where what we call mini lane, mini made in New York. Um, and then that is going to be, a, 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 I'll show you a rendering in a second. Um, and then we have some street trees that are going to be added to 43rd, 42nd, and 41st streets. 
um, and just to, uh, to a different view without sort of like those zoom in areas. This is more of a comprehensive look at what that public realm area looks like. Um, again, these are probably drawings that you've seen before. This construction has not yet started, um, but we'll get to the schedule of, of where this is in sequencing at the end. Um, but we are really excited about this. It's going to be beautiful and it's going to be, um, uh, and yeah, it's going to be great public access. So again, these are some of those images that you've probably seen before. This is what it's going to look like uh, in front of unit C down to the water. This is what I described as mini lane, that core plaza area. Again, this is area that used to have um, vehicles in it will not be totally pedestrianized um, and be an amenity for the campus, but also great public open space for, uh, for the public who wants to enjoy. Um, so here's the project schedule for this part of the project. And as I mentioned, this obviously sustains a pause during COVID. It restarted in July of last year. The Garment Hub construction is underway and we anticipate substantial completion in June of 2022. Unit C uh, design and permitting is underway. The construction work will start next month and we anticipate substantial completion in 2022. That's a, sort of a lighter touch of the, of the work on that building, which is why it will finish sooner. And then the public realm will also start this summer. And then we imagine, we think substantial completion will be in summer, end of the summer of next year. So again, we, we are carrying some delays due to COVID, unfortunately. That said, we are, we are, we are back underway and we are excited about this work. Um, another thing that's really noteworthy about all of our work here is that, you know, we set, M uh, you may know this, we set MWBE goals for all of our construction projects. The goal for this project was 38% of all subcontractors um, of, the, uh, of the CM being MWBE companies. I'm happy to report that right now the current rate of, of award is 79% which our team has been working really hard at and, and we're really excited about. Um, this is obviously one of the ways that we support um, minority and business, uh, business enterprises uh, through our contracting. So it's, uh, it's definitely great to see us being successful in this area, not just meeting, but exceeding our goals. Um, we're also going to talk tonight about uh, a new project that um, uh, we are sort of hot off the presses. As I mentioned, Eastern Effects is here with us tonight. Um, and this is a project that um, has been in the works for a, a little bit of time. Uh, and I'll, I'll run through it now and then we'll, ask, we'll do Q&A afterwards. So Eastern Effects um, is a Brooklyn-based company that runs um, TV, film, and media studio production facilities, as well as a lighting and grip rental business. Um, you may be familiar with the fact that um, many uh, properties were, um, were, were purchased under eminent domain or uh, the city exercise eminent domain to accommodate the Gowanus Canal Superfund remediation um, around the Gowanus Canal in, in Gowanus, <laughs> including the property where Eastern Effects uh, studio production facility is currently located. Shortly thereafter, City Hall directed EDC to provide relocation assistance to Eastern Effects in the form of a sublease on a sole source basis within the Bush Terminal campus um, through either the renovation or building of, of, of a new bit uh, um, of a new space. And uh, tonight we're announcing that that lease uh, will be taken to EDC's board for approval. Um, that approval meeting is tomorrow. Um, and we are looking forward for you to um, get to know Eastern Effects, uh, which is a, a local South Brooklyn business. They're located in the Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Business Zone, um, and they are going to be great neighbors. So let me just do a little bit of a deeper dive into their lease. Um, like I mentioned, they're going to be on the, that Unit D site um, on the North Campus. It's a 20-year lease with a 12-year renewal option. It's a 70,000-foot new construction building within a, on a 48,000-square-foot site. This is going to be two sound stages, um, plus an equivalent amount, more or less equivalent amount of support space, production office, and ancillary uses. Um, uh, they also may take some rooftop space, depending on whether the building ends up being able to support it. Uh, we're excited about this project because it uh, will mean the preservation and the relocation of up to 300 permanent full-time equivalent jobs. This, is, um, this figure incorporates both a portion of the Eastern FX staff that is dedicated to the um, Gowanus studio location, as well as the um, jobs that come through for different productions. Um, you, uh, you may be familiar with Eastern Effects. Um, they are, I, I know them mostly from having been the place where the Americans were shot, uh, although I'm sure uh, Scott Levy or, or Laura, who both from uh, Eastern Effects were here with us tonight, will be able to speak to uh, some of the other productions that their, their studios have supported over time. Um, Eastern Effects will also be required to use our Hire NYC program to market local, job, uh, mo lo mar 
market jobs locally, and they'll also be required to do living wage and prevailing wage when applicable. And as a reminder, this is a project um, pretty different from the Signer Studios project where, excuse me, they are designing and operating a, a large facility. In this case, EDC will be designing the facility and constructing the facility uh, on behalf of the city. It will, it will be a city asset and then Eastern Effects will take that lease from us. Um, so I'm sure we'll have more questions on this uh, when we get to the Q&A, um, but we are excited to share the news that Eastern Effects is going to be a Sunset Park neighbor. We um, have been very impressed by uh, how much support they have from their local Gowanus community um, and look forward to um, having them introduce themselves to you uh, in anticipation of the target opening date uh, in July of 2025 at Bush Terminal. Another project we wanted to um, sort of uh, talk about tonight is a new project at uh, Pier 6, uh, the, the, which is the westward extension of 42nd Street within Bush Terminal Campus. Um, the idea would be to, to rehab this pier uh, as an amenity, uh, public amenity, similar to how Pier 4 is a public amenity at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, which is to say um, a, a public access pier that comprises uh, public walkway access, um, fishing, maritime uses um, like uh, like uh, like tie ups for boats, public parking, um, and if feasible, components of the eco pier concept that had previously been contemplated for Pier Five. That's not necessarily in lieu of a future Pier Five concept, um, but just having an early pilot start on seeing if we can figure out how to put like a living edge uh, on some of that public walkway to incorporate some of the interests that previously had been in around um, public design and uh, sorry, a, a public education uh, about, about marine life. Um, and I'm happy to report that Christine is gonna be out in waders with Bart uh, later this week, learning all about the eelgrass and sargassum. Um, so we are excited to start a, sort of a, a public engagement process later this year to really scope what the different project components of that pier will be. So basically all everything I've said out loud right now is as much as we've, <laughs> as far as we've gotten, we, we do want to sort of copy what's been quite successful and quite an important public uh, amenity at, um, at the Brooklyn Army Terminal and be able to use this to accommodate tenant parking as well as um, parking for uh, Bush Terminal Pierce Park more public access, more maritime um, interface, but we have a, a lot of work to do both with the public um, uh, on some of the things that folks desire to see on that public edge, um, as well as with our designers to, to talk about what's feasible. So really, really like, you know, step zero so far, but looking forward to coming back on this project. Um, and I'm sure we'll have questions at the end. Then the last set of things I wanted to mention are projects that I would describe as sort of like status quo. So um, some of those, and those are the ones in solid yellow, are projects that are currently occupied or in use in some way, and I'll, I'll go through one by one. These are projects that we expect to continue to be used the same way that they are. And then there's the vacant properties in dotted yellow line that will evolve over time, um, but don't are not currently occupied. So I'll just I'll just go through them each of them quickly. So the first one is the administration building. That's the I don't know if you can see my cursor. That's the small yellow building um, that's on the way to Bush Terminal Pierce Park. Um, that is currently occupied by two uh, sets of artists and we are um, potentially doing another arts related lease on the second floor. Um, and that, that we do not plan to make any uh, imminent changes to that administration building. Unit B is also tenanted in with light manufacturing uses. It's in much better shape that building overall than the other buildings um, on this property. And so we continue to expect that to be uh, for light manufacturing uses. And then Pier 7 um, is what we call habitat restoration. This is also a deteriorating pier that has been, um, is being sort of deconstructed over time as part of agreement with DEC to clear uh, water column table, water table column, maybe I'm getting that phrase right, um, in, in order to, to, to daylight some of that, um, that previous pier. In terms of the vacant buildings, we have the cafe building, which as anyone knows, is in quite a deteriorated condition. We had attempted to get a food use in there recently, but um, it requires a lot more investment that we currently have slated for it. Um, the roundhouse building, which is adjacent to that, as some of you may be familiar with, some of that uh, actually collapsed several years ago, um, and it, it, the rest of it is also in stabilized but deteriorated condition. Um, the powerhouse, of course, uh, be beautiful old industrial building, also in extremely deteriorated condition. And then Pier 5, um, which uh, folks have sort of a, uh, have had a vision for an eco Pier 4. Uh, there are no other plans in the future, um, but, you know, we sort of hold out um, 
on the visioning for future potential eco peer use. Um, although we do think that peer six is probably the best first place to pilot some of those ideas. Um, so again, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. I have this one slide. I did want to say one unrelated thing before we get to Q&A, just while I have your attention. Um, and, then, and then we can circle back to questions on this, not entirely unrelated, but somewhat unrelated. Um, we actually have, uh, the last time that we were here together, I think it was in April, we were talking about the Sunset Park Task Force evolution. And I just wanted to give a few updates on that before we go back and talk about um, Bush Terminal. So tomorrow morning, we actually have our first public quarterly meeting. Um, the public participant link is here and we've shared it with Jeremy before and I imagine he has circulated it with you. You. Um, I want to ask everyone to bear with us as we figure out uh, how to implement all these changes um, uh, incrementally because it's, it's quite a lot of new things, in particular figuring out the new technology. Um, but tomorrow is going to be our first public meeting, so we're looking forward to seeing some members of the public joining us there. We also, as part of this, as you may know, we have new membership, uh, we're opening up membership for new applications, and um, we know that there's sort of a lot of eager energy for that right now, but also some folks that will want to apply later in the year, so we're going to do for just this first year only sort of quarterly applications, so we'll take the first round of applications in the next three weeks to get the, 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 the highest enthusiasm folks uh, on board first, and then we'll do another uh, round of applications in the fall when we have time to do more substantial outreach. Um, so SBIDC is going to uh, take the lead on helping with that. We sent the application again out to Jeremy earlier in the week, so he has it, and I imagine he has circulated it. Um, but if he, uh, if you still want, you can reach out to Michaela at SBIC. Her email address is on um, is on the screen. The first round of applications are going to be due July 16th, but again, we'll have another set of uh, quarterly applications uh, throughout this year, so that we have a chance to do substantial outreach and get um, make folks aware of the opportunity. Should also mention that we are working on a new web page that's going to be up on uh, EDC's website later this summer that will incorporate all of the formal documents, all of this information. But again, uh, just bear with us as we sort of incrementally make all of these changes uh, as it's, it's quite a lot to implement. Um, but we wanted to, again, just thank you for all of your feedback in April. It has all been incorporated um, and we're looking forward to moving forward. Okay, I'm going to go back to this map. And I think that is the end of my presentation. Uh, happy to take your questions. Um, you know, we're going to go, so thank you, Julie. We're going to go right into questions and then based upon questions, and I'm sure there will be questions pertinent to the leasing uh, of the space already to Eastern. Uh, uh, so we're going to jump right into questions. I, Joan, I saw Joan's hand up. Joan, do you have a question? I'm going to start off with you. And please raise your hand if you have a question. And when I call I'm on you. Muted. No, I have a comment. I am so delighted to see something positive that's coming to Sunset Park. And, and Julie, I want to thank you again because this is just, just thrilling for me. I'm not speaking for everybody, just myself. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, that's it. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you. Jen. <laughs> uh, Nick is 80 and then John DeLuper. And I, I should also say there's obviously a, a huge team working on it at EDC. I'm just the sort of messenger today, but there's, you know, there are dozens of people working on this um, throughout our organization. So we will extend your gratitude to them as well. On a slightly different note, um, Julie, I do have a couple of questions. Um, of specifically, um, what is the estimated um, usable life for these buildings after you guys have done these upgrades? I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but it should substantially prolong their useful life. Um, the but I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure someone knows the answer to that question. I just don't have it off the top of my head. There's a lead into that, which is essentially, so I saw you basically were showing pictures of basically retrofitting the existing heating systems. And so if you're using steam or you're using other antiquated heating systems, I think you're going to have a very, very hard time um, complying with the city's sustainability goals. Um, yeah, and we, when I say hard time, I mean impossible. Um, I will admit that my um, area of expertise is not in uh, building systems infrastructure. However, we do have a team uh, of folks who on our team who are looking into that, not only because we want to 
do the right thing when it comes to energy efficiency, but also we're quite aware of all the local laws. Um, so I will take that comment back and find out more information for you. But I, but I, I, I totally, I'm totally my, in agreement with you. <laughs> my next comment was really in, in as it applies to local on 97, because I can tell you just from doing what I do for a living as a mechanical engineer, it is very, yep. very difficult to get those yep. types of systems to comply. The next question I have was, so I saw all the renderings. What is the means of protection from storm surge and other things like that that you're doing? Yep, great question. So uh, the buildings that are in the floodplain in order to comply with uh, Appendix G all have uh, requirements for retrofit. So again, I don't have off the top of my head exactly what those building systems are, but each of the buildings is being fortified, that's being invested in is being fortified for wet and dry flood protection as um, appropriate. But I can certainly get back to you with the exact building systems up update. Specifically, though, um, where are the electric services going to be located? Typically, they're located on the front. Okay, you're moving them up. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, finally, um, in terms of stormwater, um, as you probably know, um, you know, our main storm system hasn't been upgraded, even though it's supposed to have been upgraded for the last 30 years. Um, are you going to be installing uh, detention tanks in these buildings? Uh, I don't want to speak out of turn because I don't remember where we land on this. I think the answer is that we are mm -hmm. we are doing what we are doing what is required uh, for retention on site. But Nick, Nick, what I think we should do is just circle back with you with some of the answers to specific questions. Okay. Um, because I because I I, do, I don't want to speak incorrectly about what the what the ultimate uh, design solution was. But um, we are we will be in compliance with Unigy as well okay. as any of the um, uh, DEP requirements for stormwater retention. I think what we're really suggesting here is regardless of what Appendix G says, because that's largely a joke, um, it's really the community would push you for detention to try to lessen the load on the storm sewer, specifically yeah. along Third Avenue in a very recent event. There was such a rush of storm water going through those pipes that it actually shot the uh, lids about five feet in the air along Third Avenue. So anything that can be done to reduce that would be greatly appreciated. Um, the remainder of my questions really um, boil now down to tenancy. And um, I, I know a while back there was a walkthrough um, for uh, garment related businesses. And from the feedback that I got from a number of those businesses was that there really wasn't too much interest in this location for various reasons. Um, you know, a lot of folks were trying to be relocated from Midtown Manhattan, where, you know, the original district was and there was not a lot of interest. So have you seen a lot of interest and what percentage do you think of the floor space you'll be able to fill? Yeah, so we're actually seeing quite a high demand for the space. Um, and I think that uh, some of the feedback you maybe have heard was for folks that weren't used to being in South Brooklyn. We're seeing a lot of demand from folks in the neighborhood and folks in South Brooklyn. Um, and I feel quite confident actually we are uh, between 25 and 50% pre-leased on the space. And again, I wish I could share some of it, but I. You know, so, uh, until it's signed, it's not signed. Um, but we have already um, relocated some of those tenants into other spaces in Bush Terminal in anticipation for being uh, in Unit A. Um, and we think that this has been quite appealing for contract manufacturing, especially folks that are already located sort of in the in the, in the greater South Brooklyn area. Um, so we feel really, really quite confident. We also, the other thing we should note is that um, just based on what we, where we see the market um, more generally at the Army Terminal, we know that um, small spaces are in quite high demand. And so we um, have a variety of floor plates that are available here, some large ones that are already spoken for, as well as much smaller ones that we know are sort of going to go like hotcakes. But the tenanting strategy, you sort of get your anchors and then you get your smaller guys um, and gals. And so um, I'm actually quite optimistic on this point. Um, what is the, gonna... um, the range of dollars per square foot on your leases? Yep. So it totally depends on the size of the unit, obviously, but we're looking at between like 13 and a half and $27, depending on the amount of space and some of the other agreements. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's a, it, it certainly is a range. It's below market in certain spaces. It's at market at, at certain other ones. Are you providing TI to any of these tenants? So we don't typically provide TI. We typically would do some rent credits uh, in order to offset some of their costs, just because it's kind of a nightmare for us to do small tenant fit outs. Um, but yeah, it's similar to how we do our deals at the Army Terminal. The sort of the, the type of package would be very similar here. In your leases, are there any um, local employment mandates or is it open? 
So it's typically open when we do very large, like these larger deals, like the signer deal, like the Eastern effects deal, we do have what we call hiring YC, um, which is what, you know, when folks are hiring for five or more new jobs um, for some of these smaller tenants, we don't tend to do it. Although we do highly encourage using the workforce one center um, in order to, to, to market those jobs locally. So again, when we do, you know, for all of EDC projects, when we do very large projects, we do mandate the, the use of hiring YC. Um, it's actually illegal uh, to mandate local hiring. Um, but we try to encourage it by working with local partners as much as possible. Okay. Um, the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, thank you for coming here. Thank you for being more open. I can tell you that, you know, there are quite a few people that would still like to get more openness from EDC as to what's going on. And, you know, please continue in that effort. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. What's, uh, Julie, what's TI, Nick? Or uh, uh, tenant improvements. So typically, hey. sorry, you can explain Nick if you want. Basically, it's money that's given to the tenant to offset their build out costs. So there's a couple different ways that that can be done, either via like rent credits, as Julie said, where, you know, you get X number of months free so that you can build out your space and then occupy your space and get during, you know, get going for business purposes before you actually have to start paying rent. Sometimes a landlord will kick in a sweetener where they'll say, OK, you know, we'll give you five or 20 or, you know, 15 bucks a foot to help with your build out costs to encourage you to come in. Yeah, and it's very typical for like an office user. Um, it's less typical for for uh, uh, industrial user, but we still, you know, again, it's all about the overall package. So sometimes from a cash flow perspective, the tenant wants more, like is willing to pay more for rent if you may help them make the investment up front. So it's just, it's all part of the overall package. Okay, and, and how many uh, square foot in total of working space in, in you today? Um, the Garment Hub is gonna be 200,000 uh, square feet. Okay. It's 211, two, two, two I think. You can't John, hear. John DeLooper, then Cynthia Gonzalez. Okay, hi. Thanks for your presentation. Can you, you can hear me? I can hear you. So she can't hear you, but I can hear you. Okay, excellent. No, no worries. Okay, so uh, I did want to say, uh, seeing your presentation, I was very encouraged to see that you're using the Brooklyn Army Terminal as a model for some of your pedestrianization efforts and your efforts to separate uh, the, the business traffic from the people. Really well done. I really love taking my family. We go down there. My son likes to scooter in that area and all those benches and stuff are fantastic. So I'm glad to see you're doing that as a model. That said, I do want to ask you to consider if you are going to make Pier 6 use a or have a parking lot, you may want to consider making a wider pedestrian walkway, because I know that sometimes when you're with the people who are fishing and the people who are walking, and I would also say that if it can be designed, the parking to uh, limit the ability to uh, do drag racing and donuts, which unfortunately on evenings and weekends can be a big issue with the parking lot because the pier is a quarter mile long. It's got long straight stretches. Uh, if that could be designed uh, in other, to be aware of that and to have either barrier and uh, tools that you guys use to, to do that stuff. So um, I also did want to ask um, in terms of accessing this park. A couple years ago, you had some of your colleagues came here and talked about a lot of sidewalk improvements, drainage improvements, street trees going from 39th Street down to the water. Is that still on the table as part of this? And is, is that still planned to help connect that to the rest of the community? So I think maybe on your last question, you're referring to some of the, um, the larger infrastructure project that we are doing along sort of 39th Street, as well as a couple of other intersections. We call it the Capital the Sunset Park Capital Infrastructure Project. That project is still underway. That was also one of the projects that got delayed as part of COVID, but there, and then because it got delayed so long that they had to rebid it, but they are rebidding it right now. We expect construction to start late summer, early fall. Very cool. Uh, I just want to ask one other thing. Since you mentioned uh, Brooklyn Army Terminal, one thing we uh, is pushing the stroller down and at the entrance at uh, 63rd Street, the, the ramp has stairs on it. This came up during participatory budgeting last year with our council member. And I don't know if it ever resolved it, but it would be something worth looking into because there is a District 20 pre-K 
right in that part of the army terminal. And it's not cool to have to either take the stroller, you know, down the steps or to sure. go into the middle of traffic. I can, I can relate. Um, I'm not aware of the condition myself, but I'll ask Christine who's on to follow up with the arm with the, um, our, and just so we can better understand what the condition is and what some of the challenges might be. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. John, follow up with Jeremy on that condition at 60 at the army terminal, just so we know we can get it, get it uh, solved. Sure, I'll be happy. I can send you. I can send him some photos. Probably good. Yeah, and just so you know, you know, like obviously our main pedestrian. We we, we made a big deal of making the main pedestrian entrance 58th Street. I know that certain people obviously are not going to go out of their way if they're trying to get to where the pre-K is and it's inconvenient for them to go around. Um, so, you know, it may be a, a little bit of a mismatch between some of the use and the function, but I hear you and we'll take a look at it. Thanks again. The farm animals. So who are you calling? Cynthia Gonzalez and then Pat Ruiz. And you, Pat. Hello. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm clear, Sam. Okay. Um, my question oh, story time. relates to the proposed parking yeah. for the area. How many spaces are going to be added, and are these spaces going to be metered? Um, so we are currently, as I mentioned, starting the like we're really at uh, starting the process for the Pier Six um, design process. So I can't, I don't know how many spots are going to be available. There are certain other spots that are being um, created as part of the designer project for the park, um, as well as uh, elsewhere. But we don't anticipate that they are going to be. Hey, get away from there! Get away from there! Sorry. Um, uh, we don't anticipate that they will be metered, but uh, we are still in the process of figuring out um, exactly what the, that count will be. Thanks. More to come. Yeah. Hi, Julie. Um, I, uh, aside from being the second vice chair of Community Board 7, I am also the president of the Boricua Festival Committee, and we have had South at the Waterfront, unfortunately not last year, not this year, but um, we hope to to be back. My question is, as you know, at Pier 4, the challenge is always where we're going to put our stage with the uh, metered parking and the parking bumps, et cetera. And I'm wondering, are there any plans for an outdoor entertainment space on any of these piers in the future um, for us to consider to have more um, events for the community? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think we are thinking much more broadly about how to accommodate sort of multi-use spaces because we obviously have been really excited about being able to accommodate more public uses in the in the past couple of years, including the Baruch Festival. I don't know if you've if you've seen, but we've actually started using those um, big tree pit circles uh, as stage, and like that was something that wasn't designed that way, but it turns out it's great to use that way. So I would say we're really excited about multiple types of event uses. We aren't thinking about a dedicated event use, but we are trying to think about how to use the public space for pop ups. And, and other types of events. So um, I know it's not always a perfect fit, but um, we, we aren't <laughs> contemplating. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. we're not contemplating a, 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 de a dedicated uh, event space, but we are excited about the opportunity to use some of those public spaces as, as pop-up event spaces. Yeah. yeah, it would be great if you guys really would consider it because every year we go through, where are we going to put the stage and yeah. you know try to avoid sure. some of the bumps and all of that. But thank you so much. And we look forward to being yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, us, us too. And and I should say, you know, it, it, this is a great example of a piece of feedback for when we go into the Pier 6 design, um, because like a lot of this stuff, like I wasn't here for the Pier 4 design, um, but, you know, I don't, so I don't know the story about like whether the, 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 the walkway was designed at that length or whether it was just sort of what was able to be carved well, out, but we can, we can be much more intentional about this right. kind of stuff. Well, so looking forward to your actually, feedback. Actually, actually, and I'll make it short because I know other people want to speak before the parking meters went in, placing the stage and doing the setup yeah. for our event was so much easier. Yeah, it well, I think the parking, those, I think the parking, the parking meters, meters are were gone. not there. Um, but they're gone, they're, they're gone, gone now. now. Yeah. Really? Look yeah, they that. were taken they're, out, they were taken out like a year and a half ago, I think. They were, they were there well, temporarily. Yeah, probably. They're not, well, they're not there anymore. All right, thank you so much for that. I didn't know that, but thank you. Yep. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm just kidding. 
give me one second. I'm going to try to. No problem. Uh, I, next up, when Julie is ready, we'll have Cindy Vandenbosch, John Santori, and uh, somebody else I saw. But... And, uh, John, if you just want to start talking, uh, this is Ratty here. I'm here. I'm not going to speak. Sorry. All right. I'm back. That's okay. We had, uh, we had, I, I thought I saw John. So John first, then we'll go to Cynthia Vandenbosch and whoever else. Raise your hand if you, if I haven't called your name. Um, hi, Ms. Stein. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you for the very helpful presentation as you're judging, as you're juggling your parental duties at the same time. So thank you very much. I was hoping to go around the map quickly. So sure. the garment manufacturing hub is unit A, right? So that's 211,000 square feet. And how many jobs do you anticipate being uh, in that space if it was fully tenanted? I can't do the math on the fly. I know we've shared this information with you before. Um, I can try to look it up or I, we can follow up, but you know, I, I, we, I, we expect, we expect yeah. that, uh, that, that with the exception of, so not counting the Eastern effects jobs, that it's about a thousand jobs on the North campus in between units A, C and B. So, so when you say, a th so a thousand jobs on the North campus, 1000 jobs for A, C and B. So with that is, so unit, C and unit B, do they currently have tenants in them? Unit B has tenants in it. Unit C is only partially occupied. Unit A is vacant. Okay. So are, when you say a thousand jobs, is that once all rehabilitations, because the next, the next rehabilitation would be for unit C. Is that right? Yep. That's the one that's, that's going to be underway shortly. So if that was rehabilitated and fully tenanted with light manufacturing, and then unit B, if unit B, unit B would also be rehabilitated and also filled with light manufacturing. There, there, so unit B, there's no investment um, plans right now. As I mentioned, it's in much better shape than the other two buildings were. Okay, so if you're, so the thousand jobs applies to a fully tenanted unit A and then a rehabilitated and fully tenanted unit C and then unit B as currently occupied. Those three things put together equals 1,000 jobs. So I'm checking my notes. I, if, if you want to break down, I can go back and do some math for you. I'm just checking my notes right now, so I'm not going to verify that, but that is what I have in my notes. Um, but it sounds like you're trying to ask a very specific question. So mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the specific question? So if I can break in, Julie, while you do that math, John, you have other, do you have other questions you can go while, while that math is um, We'll come back. Yeah, well, sure, sure, sure I do. Yes, yes. Um, so the the Eastern effects, so that's two to three. I'm sorry, I have to go back to, to garment, the garment hub. Do, do you know how many garment jobs, though? You're, you have to calculate how many garment jobs would be in unit A. Uh, I don't have math in front of you, but in front of me, but okay. I know that we've answered this question for you before, but we can certainly circle back with it. I, I, can you tell me, I'm sorry, and I, I'm not not trying to be difficult. I, I don't, re maybe I just don't remember. I don't remember when the garment job specifically has been presented to the public. Was that number ever given to the community board for unit A? We, we've, we've been here quite a few times over the last two years. I, I have it in my notes, which makes me think that I answered it, but why don't we circle back with you on, on the details here? Okay. The, the other thing about- it's not, unit it's, not a, it's not a secret. It's just, I need to, I need to do the math and I'm not going to do it on the fly okay. right now. Okay, so so we need unit A garment jobs, and how many of those jobs would be new jobs versus relocated jobs from other locations? You you were talking about other South Brooklyn businesses that are interested, so those would be relocated jobs, right? I don't know how many of those are considered net new. Again, we can circle back with that. Okay, and and are you are you anticipating moving tenants from Manhattan? And do you have a sense of how many how much of how much of garment unit A would be relocated from Manhattan? So it's an open uh, rental. So anyone who's interested can come and rent there. 
Um, I don't know how many are going to end up being Manhattan. I don't know how many are going to end up being Brooklyn. I can tell you from the, the, the track record we have at this point that the, the leases we're doing are with, with Brooklyn-based businesses. Um, but I imagine that there will be some Manhattan-based businesses that also are interested in the space over time. Um, and are these, I know there were different elements to the, to the garment manufacturing. Um, I'm trying to understand how much, how much of that building would be jobs that are accessible to local Sunset Park people versus other, other jobs within the industry that are, that are more about design and might require higher levels of, of training or, yeah. or so degrees. like, like I mentioned, this is meant to be primarily manufacturing space and so most of them are going to be contract manufacturers and and other type of garment manuf excuse me garment manufacturers we sure no problem can you hear me now yes yeah, yeah, we can, yeah. sorry we didn't lose you um I was... uh, sorry can you hear me like yes can you hear me julie Yes. Just gonna as a pause. Is that is so? Is John's question about the Garment Hub, the the space is basically being designed and built by you for manufacturing, right? There's a difference between and building office space, showroom space, and and actual space for manufacturing garments. Kind of right. It's not. There's. It's not meant to be any showroom space. It's going to be primarily contract manufacturers and manufacturing jobs aligned with garment manufacturing that you see in Sunset Park. We anticipate that there will be certain units that do go to prototype designers because we know it's part of this ecosystem, but it's not meant to be an office building. It's meant to be a manufacturing building. And that, and that is the makeup of the tenants that we have so far. Um, okay, the, the, uh, so the Eastern Effects building, uh, you're going to, are, are you demolishing the existing and building a new building? That's correct. Okay, what is the cost of that project? The the project is uh, it is budgeted right now for sixty million dollars. Okay, so so before this before this Eastern Effects project, I had a number from EDC of two hundred and eighteen million dollars for the North Campus. So it's two eighteen now plus plus sixty. Is that right? Correct. So we're at two seventy eight, and then. The um, what is the you said that there was money for the Pier Six? What, what, could you say the source of that money and um, and how much it is? The source of the money is also city capital. Right now, there is a budget of around thirty million dollars, but we are still in the process. Again, we're super early on in that, so a little bit TBD. So so but so we're currently at three oh three hundred and eight million in in city funds. Correct. Okay. And the Eastern effects job will be, um, those are, those are jobs that are, you use two to 300 permanent jobs. Are those, those jobs that are relocated from Eastern effects? How, how many of those jobs will be relocated versus, versus net new jobs? So, uh, we expect that, you know, because there are going to be film industry jobs, there's going to be a certain portion of them that are related to Eastern effects, uh, operations themselves. Um, and so those are jobs that we move over. The the um, the facility here is larger than the facility that they have at, uh, in 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 Gowanus. So a certain of them will be um, will be larger, but we expect most of them to be sort of relocated FTE capacity. Again, we can follow up with more details on that if you're interested. Um, yeah, let, let me just ask one more one more question, and then I and then I I want to allow other people to to speak. Did um, did EDC meet with any local elected officials to discuss Eastern effects as a tenant um, before you decided to give them the lease? So this has been an ongoing process. There has been quite a few folks looking out for Eastern effects relocation. And so there are a lot of folks who are supportive uh, of, of the project itself. Um, and so, you know, there, 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 have been, there have been meetings over time, I'm sure. Um, but we should just say that this is a this is a project that has had broad support, especially coming from the Gowanus community, of figuring out how to um, how to relocate and save these jobs. Okay, but we're we're the the representatives of this site: Diane Savino, Jerry Nadler, Councilman Menchaco, uh, Eric Adams. Were any of them involved in discussions about bringing bringing the company to the North Campus? 
we've had conversations with many of those elected officials over the years. Over the years, so since 2017, you have spoken to those, all four of them? Uh, I, th I think all four of them, I'm not sure that that we've talked to Savino's office. Okay. Yeah. Unless, me, unless, unless, unless Raddy has, and I'm not aware. Let me get, I think earlier on the process we did, but Sure, Roddy. Go ahead. The answer is the elected officials that represent this area um, have been um, kept in the loop on what's going on. Okay, so I want to just so to, to get to, to John's question, maybe uh, put it in my own words. Sorry, John. Is it so? You're you're leasing how many? Is it three hundred thousand square feet? The leasing effects. What is the, what is the seventy seventy thousand square feet? Thirty thousand square feet. Okay, um, so it's not going to be a it's not going to be a huge building. No. Um, although I assume you're going to be uh, you're going to have to give it to the public design commission at some point or something like that. Sure, it'll go through all the all the appropriate processes. And, and you'll share the renderings with us when. Oh yeah, yeah. Thanks. So what I think to John's question about elected officials is: is it standard when you're leasing something? EDC is leasing nothing this size in our neighborhood or in any neighborhood. Um, these are all our neighborhoods. Um, is it standard to bring in elected officials to say we're going to lease this into the into, if not the negotiation process, at least informing them? So this. I think I think it would be more appropriate to say that we are generally in touch with the elected officials uh, around the site about all of the work that we're doing and uh, this project among them. Um, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that anyone besides EDC or Eastern Effects was part of the negotiation itself. But we generally keep the elected officials in the loop. Otherwise, they would be very mad at us. And so we're constantly in touch with folks um, about all the things that we're working on, including this project. Well, yeah, I imagine because they, they, you know, ideally, of course, they have the same concerns as us in terms of uh, externalities and local hiring and, and density. Of yep. All and right. Look, I, uh, yep. So I, I know I'm out of time. I just want to ask just in order to follow up, Ms. Stein, how, how can we best follow up with, with additional questions? So it sounds like you have more jobs questions specifically that you're interested in, is particularly around the net new jobs. Um, and so we mm -hmm. will take a look and we will circle back. But should we con is there somebody that we should contact specifically with, with a list of questions? You can send your list to me, John. Uh, okay. Would... Sure. Thank you. I want to go to thanks, John. I want to go to Cindy and then Nick back to Nick Azadian. Cindy Vandenbosch this time. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, I'm just um, curious to hear um, what kinds of and whether this maybe this is too early in the process since you just discussed this today, but the um, potential maritime uses that you anticipate um, might be needed um, at Pier Six. If you could speak to that, I'd appreciate it. Yep. So I think again, like Pier Four is a pretty good example of what to expect, both from a, um, you know, a excursion vessel perspective, but also from some of the freight, uh, you know, the freight NYC uh, goals that we have. And we have this, uh, uh, sorry, I fixed that back. We have the Dock NYC program that helps us manage uh, our bulkheads across the city. Um, they do both uh, uh, freight as well as um, excursion vessels, and we would expect it to be very similar to that. Um, but I think, again, we're super early in this process, and so I don't have more details to share except for that. Okay, thank you. And um, I, in terms of um, amenities for the people that will be working on the campus, um, and sorry if this was something you discussed, I know there's going to be the cafe that's there. Will that be uh, kind of Otherwise, will people go out of the campus to to eat or get food if they don't bring it to work? Yeah, so we're certainly looking to have a food use on campus and, you know, accommodate some of that use. You know, from our experience at the Army Terminal, a lot of the uh, a lot of the people who work at these um, businesses are bring bring lunch. And so, you know, it's 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 hard to support a very robust um, retail environment within the campus. And we do expect that there to be spillover effects for, you know, purchasing food locally as well as on campus. Um, so we'd like to have the, that as an amenity. But we also acknowledge that um, to the point, the point uh, earlier about who these jobs are for that a lot of folks are going to be bringing their lunch as well. 
Um, and the last thing that I was um, hoping you could just speak to is I know that for this project that there's been a lot of research around sort of the garment industry in New York as, as compared with other cities. And I was wondering if you could zoom out and kind of give us a picture of like how this fits into the broader garment industry in New York City, like how this is strategically positioned. I understand it's 70,000 square feet, but you sort of what is the you know, in terms of attracting tenants and thinking about the position of this particular garment hub, um, how do you kind of see it positioned, whether it's within the context of the city or more broadly kind of um, compared to other other cities and what's happening in the garment sector? Sure. So I'll be able to speak to like a little bit of your question because it's certainly not my area of expertise. But, um, you know, we know that contract manufacturing is a big business in Sunset Park, um, which is why we thought there was a good alignment with existing workforce and, and creating new opportunities. Um, you know, we expect this to serve both um, sort of like the legacy industry in New York City as well, where as well as where we see a lot of manufacturing going. So you see a lot of last mile customization, prototype design development, it's really important um, to be close to your designers because you can, you know, you can quickly make changes. And so we expect it to sort of function with um, the way contract manufacturing has always functioned in New York City, which is supporting the larger industry, um, but also the, uh, following a lot of the sustainability trends, as well as some of that like last mile customization um, that we're seeing like a big demand in the market for. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, thanks, Cindy. Uh, just before I go to Nick and then back to John, Jeremy, I need some institutional memory. Uh, is Pier 6, was that in the original Bush Terminal Pierce Park footprint? No, Pier 6 was not. Pier 5 was, however. Okay, thanks. All right, Nick, all you. And then back to John, and then we're going to go to some panelists. I'll be very brief. These actually have more to do with um, the financials. Um, do you have an estimate of what your dollars per square foot construction wise is going to be? Uh, I, I do not. Uh, how about historically? I don't have that information in front of me. All right. Um, I guess the next question I have is then what is the estimated ROI? Um, so it's a little bit, you know, we as non-traditional uh, uh, mission driven landlords, we don't necessarily calculate uh, our investments the same way a private in investor would, would do so. So we're making investments in these historic buildings. We're making some intentional decisions that are pretty different than what the market would bring. So the ROI is not really the right way to think about it. For example, let me ask like, a different question then. Yep. Um, are you estimated to recoup at least the initial uh, monetary infusion by the time you need to be considering replacement cost? I don't know that off the top of my head, but again, as mission driven landlords, we think about it a little bit differently. Like for just, I'm just going to give you one example. So the private, the sector doesn't bring on a lot of subdivided spaces because subdivisions are really expensive, as you know. And so we intentionally want to help small, you know, and startup businesses. So we do a lot more subdivisions than the market would otherwise bear. So again, like we can get back to you on some of that information, but we, 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 often, we often make decisions that are more mission driven. Right. So I, I understand that. the intent is not to make money. My question is really, I'm just trying to not create a future liability Sure. where, you know, if you're pouring in a whole bunch of money, we're revamping these buildings that have been, you know, obviously decrepit for many, many years and, you know, from lack of maintenance and et cetera. I just want to make sure that we don't have the same issue or a larger issue where it becomes a money sink in another 20 years. Sure. And, and I think one of the things that is kind of interesting is like there has been such disinvestment in these properties for such a long time and there was disinvestment in them before they came to us. And so, uh, you know, for anyone who's been around, these were Harborside management buildings, you know, we inherited them and then did not invest in them for the 20 years since we've had them. And so there's significant, significant deferred maintenance and the conditions are really quite shocking, honestly, um, you know, in terms of what we're building back from, in addition to like, you know, us having a totally different management framework in terms of how we are able to maintain the buildings uh, actively as the investments are made. So I think, you know, I wouldn't let past performance be an indicator of <laughs> future whatever, because I think that we're in a totally different environment, but, you know, and, and anyone who's been around since these were Harborside knows the, the conditions that we inherited the buildings in. Yeah, it's basically duct tape and hope, hopes and dreams are holding them together. But um, all right, I'll, I'll probably send a, a raft of emails to Jeremy in regards to some of the things that we've discussed just to get sure. further clarity on them. But thank you. No problem. You're welcome. So uh, we, we know you're a mission driven landlord, but it's always nice to, to make some money back no matter. A lot of us run not for profits. We still have to we still have to look at our budgets at the end of the year. Yeah. 
in business. Of oh. course. And, and look, we're always trying to balance being good stewards of the asset on behalf of the taxpayer and then also doing things like bringing on subdivisions that the market wouldn't otherwise do. So. Okay. Uh, well, I think we're going back to John and I'm going to see who else's hand is up and before we go to the attendees. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask again about uh, Eastern effects. Uh, you said that that at least is, is slated to be approved uh, by the board or voted on by the board tomorrow. Is that right? That's, that's right. It's going to our board tomorrow. And what is the, uh, what is the intended rent that Eastern will be paying for, for that space? The 70, 70,000 square feet. Yep. The, so yeah. the, they'll be paying um, in the first lease year, $1.12 million. It increases by 2% in lease years two and four. In lease year six, it steps up to 1.61, I think. And then it resets to, and then it goes uh, two or 3% increases from there. And then it resets to 95% of fair market at, at the renewal term. 95% of fair market at the renewal term. term. Okay, based based on my um, extremely amateurish calculations, that seems to be a lot less than Steiner Studios is paying based on the size of the studio. It's based on Steiner getting 650,000 square feet. I calculated them as paying uh, well, well, they they start paying 1.5 million right after five years. They start they start at 1.5 million, mm -hmm. I they're, believe, and then it goes up to three after after I think 15. So they're years. To, they're they're very different mm -hmm. lease structures. One is a ground lease, and one is a building lease, and so you can't really okay. compare the two. Um, but you uh you can't compare this. Okay, well, so it's so anyway, they're they're starting. Eastern is starting at 1.12 million dollars per year, which they they will begin paying in the first year. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you again. Thanks, John. Um, Jeremy, Thank can we? Dan, I was just wondering if I could give Scott uh, and Laura the opportunity to introduce oh, themselves since we haven't done that yet. Oh, go, go ahead, guys. Sorry, Scott and Laura. No problem. Sorry, I, I just didn't know when the right time to cut in was. Scott, Laura, you're on. You can, you can talk. You've heard, you've, you've met the community board or a good chunk of it. Well, well um, is it, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So, but Scott, yeah. can you tell me, uh, I'm curious, first off, what, what was your address in Gowanus that you're, that you're leaving? Or what are you leaving? Uh, 277 Street between um, DeGraw and Sackett. Okay. Is that now, is that now a Toll so, Brothers development or something no, like that? No, it's, it's a city parking lot is oh. what it's going to become. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, it's part of the overflow sewage tank uh, project that's associated with the Superfund of the canal, it's gonna help, that tank site is going to help reduce uh, rainwater, which uh, mixes with sewage when it rains heavily, and it's gonna divert that, it's gonna put it into a tank and uh, keep it off the streets of uh, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So they required uh, the site, which is our operating studio facility, they required that site uh, you know, for uh, construction. So you're an environmental refugee to Sunset Park. <laughs> I, I, that's a really good way of putting it. Well, yeah. Well, well you know, with, uh, we're a great neighborhood. I, I, we know that. So, but tell us a little bit about yourselves and and what's going to be. What's sure. Gonna be. Well, first of all, thank you for for having us on today uh, to the Community Board Seven. And this is a new uh, committee, the Economic Development Waterfront Committee. Thank you all for for having us here and allowing us to participate this evening. Um, we have a long history in Brooklyn, uh, uh, a little history on the company. I founded the business as an owner operator in the film and television industry in this area of Brooklyn back in 1999. It was just myself, uh, a truck and a thousand square feet uh, on Dean Street between third and fourth Avenue, which is if you ever uh, heard of where MakerBot started and became this famous that was in the offices that, that we built and uh, over time, uh, Laura, who was uh, an employee of the company, also became an owner of the business. Uh, she's on the call with us now. And we brought in a friendly competitor. Uh, his name is Chris Hayes. So there are three uh, partners who operate our business. Uh, and we grew from that 1,000 square foot facility to operating out of, you know, all over Brooklyn from Gowanus to uh, East New York, um, you know, about 163,000 square feet of space. And, you know, at the uh, 
the height of the, the pandemic, uh, sorry, pre-pandemic, we were 40 full-time employees at Eastern Effects. And um, we've really enjoyed being part of this Brooklyn community. Um, and that's why we proceeded, you know, we started in the film and television industry doing film and television equipment rentals. And then we moved into studios back in 2010 at this site. And we planned on being, you know, here for many, many years to come. We signed, you know, a 20 year lease with the landlord who never really kicks out uh, tenants. And um, we've enjoyed our time working both in Brooklyn and with local community uh, members and with other businesses in the community. And we have a lot of various relationships that we've uh, supported and, and uh, grown over the years. And we're actually very honored to be staying in Brooklyn and to be able to be eventually relocated to this site uh, in Sunset Park. Uh, we've always liked Sunset Park. We like this area. We like what the city's doing with this. Um, we feel very fortunate to be able to survive as a business under these circumstances. It's been, for lack of a better word, a very uh, trying about six years that we've been in this process. And uh, we just feel very fortunate as, as people. We have, you know, ourselves, we, we have families, we have, uh, uh, you know, children, we have staff with families and children, and, and we're just lucky to be doing something that we love doing, be doing it in an area of the world that we love doing it in. And um, we feel very lucky and honored to be continuing that in a space that we enjoy and with people that we enjoy. So that's a little bit and I can pass it to Laura who can give a little more of uh, the history and and a little more about you know what we do with the community and the relationships we have uh, to support the community. Thank you. As Scott said, thank you for giving us the opportunity to introduce ourselves um, to the community board. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more with Scott. We're uh, just very grateful, uh, grateful for uh, the opportunity for that the EDC is, is uh, offering us the space. Um, our biggest pride is being an employer in Brooklyn, um, homegrown business in Brooklyn, as Scott said. Um, we've built our reputation based on, you know, word of mouth and just our relationships within the community. Um, and that's very indicative of a business uh, like ours. Um, working in Brooklyn has been a great uh, privilege. We're really excited to be able to um, continue to hold our operations here. Um, a lot of our community um, relationships um, have been based on, you know, being a good neighbor. We take a lot of our best practices from manufacturing and industrial. We are a customer facing business as well. Um, so we know a lot about working within the community. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, different uh, positions that we have at the company, um, everything from administrative to technical. Um, all of our people that uh, have been at Eastern Effects, they've grown up with us. Um, we take great pride in um, training and working with members of the community to um, uh, pull a great group of people um, from Brooklyn and the city to, to help the business. Um, we've been working with uh, Brooklyn Workforce Innovation since 2006. Um, they've been helping us um, with various positions at the company and fulfilling these very difficult positions that um, our business relies on. Um, Red Hook on the Road is a great program through Brooklyn Workforce Innovations that has helped us with um, CDL drivers. Um, uh, the Made in New York PA training program has uh, assisted us uh, for a long time with administrative positions at the company. Um, and it, in, with respect to reciprocity, um, we've uh, assisted BWI as well. Um, Eastern Effects has long been a home for uh, training uh, the cycle students that come through the Made in New York PA training program. They've uh, come to Eastern Effects to learn how to interact with vendors um, and how to be a good 
uh, the person that interacts with uh, manufacturing and vendor business in the city. Um, we've had a lot of people come through our doors and they've grown up, they've worked for our company and they've gone on to take on uh, larger roles within the industry. Um, the SBIDC uh, as well, we've worked with them on a lot of different community um, projects. And uh, for me personally, we spent a lot of time working with uh, Fifth Avenue Committee, the SBIDC, and, and just being a good neighbor um, and uh, helping them out and uh, um, and then obviously being the beneficiary of great support over time. So again, really uh, pleased to be here and um, happy to answer any questions about our, our company. And I was going to say one little added note where I look, I liken us to survivors, you know, our, our, our time here uh, on the, we chose a business on the Gowanus Canal with buildings on both sides of the canal. And so we are kind of no strangers to survival in uh, one of our buildings had five feet of water in it during the flood and the other, you know, an amount that, you know, sent our customers running. So, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've been through it all and we're, you know, ready, you know, for our future and some, you know, a, a place to, to, to rest for many years. And we, you know, really are excited uh, when we look at this map and we see our name on the map, it's, it's such a, an exciting moment to know that there's going to be some uh, solid ground under our feet and, um, you know, a future in, in this area. And we're really, really ready to, to kind of embrace, uh, you know, your community and continue our relationships that we have uh, in the Gowanus area and then make new relationships and business relationships here. And so um, thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Scott. Uh, as far as the uh, flooding or uh, the solid ground you're talking about, you got to work that out with EDC. <laughs> I can't guarantee you. You're not, you're not, you're not going to be placed on Mount Everest. You're about six feet above, uh, above, above the sea level. So um, if that. Anyway, so I wanted to ask one question, Julie, about you. Scott, you said 40 full-time jobs you got there? So we did. we did prior to that, prior to the pandemic, that was our staff full-time staff count of our company. But when we are in operation and our studios are in full operation, the, combi the combination of both our company and our customers' employees, and we, like the Americans, I'll give you an example of that, of that show. That show ran for six seasons, which is six years. And it employed on average 250 to 300, including our staffing at just the studio. We have staffing who's exclusive, uh, who works exclusively with our location lighting business. So a portion of our staff are, are there and a portion of our staff are in studios. And, you know, the studio, this is all only a studio facility. There's not enough room at this facility for us to be warehouse. So that, that 250 to 300 is, is all studio staff as well as uh, our, our customers' jobs, which are, made, you know, high-paying union labor and it's a long-term job and many hours of work uh, done on, the, on site. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, I want to, Jeremy, if you could let, let the attendees speak because I'd like to see Michaela's had her hand up for a while from SBIC. Yep. Michaela, you could unmute yourself now. Thank you, Jeremy. Can you guys hear me? We can. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Julie, um, and to the community board. Uh, I'm Industrial Programs Manager with SPIBC, Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. Uh, just wanted to make a remark. Um, we are, are thrilled that Eastern Effects is moving into the, the eventually into the Made in NYC campus. Um, we know it's not Goanus, um, but it's, it is still within the Southwest industrial business zone and uh, we we were happy that they will be dedicated space for them um, it is not easy to relocate within the industrial business zone as as we know from our own experience and uh, we've through throughout the years uh, we have helped um, Eastern effect um, hire people and with other business services needs so just wanted to make that remark and to say that that we're here to support um, keeping industrial manufacturing businesses within South Brooklyn. Uh, that would be all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michaela. Okay. Thank you. 
Dan, um, I'd just like to request of uh, Julie, if you could uh, send us a copy of the presentation tomorrow, uh, just so we can make it uh, available to folks outside of this meeting if anybody requests. Yeah, absolutely, no problem. Thank you. And Julie, there's a, 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 a lot of questions came back to There's a lot of themes that hopefully you'll take notes on and come back with. We, 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 we have been taking extensive notes. And Pier 6, uh, as, soon as, it, as soon as the public process gets started on that, and that should be you know, whenever you, you get the, the uh, ball rolling on this, because it is a public amenity, um, let us know. There's a lot of interest in what we can do with that. So I yeah, I think this will be a super fun one. And Christine on our team will be leading that process. So she will circle back with you guys on, on next steps. But we think it'll be sort of like some incremental Sorry, some uh, some initial conceptual stuff early on, and then once we have designers on board next year, more intensive. But um, yeah, Chris, we're, we, we've been talking about kicking that off. I think it's going to be super fun. Thanks, guys. And so I don't see any more hands up for EDC uh, or, the, or, or questions or comments on the North Campus. So I'll, I'll let you guys go. And I want to ask the committee for new business and old business, not even new business. So sorry, I just want to be sure we're we're released. You're released. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for having us tonight, guys. Really appreciate your time. And thank you to Scott and Laura for joining us as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you nice all. You. Thank Very you nice all. meeting you all. Thank you for the time. John Santori, you have a question on new business or comment on new business? I, I, I have a new business proposal, yes. Sure. Is that is now the time for it? Please. Um, I have a, a resolution that I would like to put before the committee. Uh, I emailed the text to members of the committee I have email addresses for, and I would be happy to, should I, should I uh, just read the resolution first? And then I can, I can quickly explain why I think it's necessary. Yes, go ahead. All right, I'm gonna just read the resolution first. Um, and again, about, about seven or eight members of the committee have this, uh, of, of whom a few are here tonight. So the resolution reads, whereas Sunset Park residents and CB7 members consistently advocate for direct public involvement in local economic and development decisions, resolved is a two-part resolution. Uh, so part one, EDC should not approve any tenant contracts for the Made in New York campus until A, representatives from EDC and the mayor's office have jointly hosted at least one future public meeting where they answer questions on the project with an option to submit questions in advance. B, all relevant local officials have issued public statements taking a position on the North Campus project, including Councilperson Carlos Menchaca, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, Representative Nidia Velasquez, Representative Jerry Nadler, Assemblyperson Marcelo Matanez, State Senator Diane Savino, and State Senator Zelnor Myri. And the second part is EDC should work with CB7 and the Sunset Park community to discuss and develop future plans for other portions of the North Campus in a public in transparent manner. Um, and I will say I will say quickly that I think tonight's presentation was great. I have uh, a lot of confidence in the staff of EDC and in people like Ms. Stein who are consistently well prepared and obviously very well versed in these topics. Um, but there is simply no evidence that this project, which is which is now just got even larger tonight, just just for everybody's uh, just just because we're it's important to keep score here. Um, in terms of the total size now for the North Campus alone, we are up to 381,000 square feet um, because Pier 6 is, is about 100,000, if I remember correctly. It's more than five acres. Um, and we're now adding 70,000 more for Eastern Effects. So we already were at 211. So now we're up to 381 just currently. And the, and the cost now is up to $308 million of public money. Um, Ms. Stein and, and Raddy Miranda said that, that our elected officials were aware of Eastern effects. None of our elected officials have ever spoken about Eastern effects to this community. Um, none of our elected officials have ever spoken about this project in any capacity to the community. Um, apparently Eastern effects is already set to be approved by the board tomorrow. We're hearing it for the first time tonight. And again, you can have two things can be true at the same time. I think you can be absolutely have a lot of confidence in EDC and believe that they are taking actions for the public benefit, but you can also demand transparency and involvement. And I think the first thing this community board should do is to say that this is not the way massive amounts of money should be spent on public lands. And we should, we should demand transparency and we should demand meetings and disclosure. 
um, especially for the additional properties going forward um, and for all of these projects. So I just think we need to we need to make a statement of the way you start a process is by saying that the status quo is not OK. And in my opinion, the status quo of this project is not OK. So if there's any way that I can share the text of the resolution, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to reread it. But that's my that is my proposal. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for letting me talk about it. That's fine. The, 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 thank you. The, the spirit, so I'll just, I'll start. The spirit of that resolution is fine. There's a technical issue, though, of, of we're kind of, when we say that EDC can't do X before we hear from uh, a litany of elected officials of, 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 at, at various levels, um, it kind of puts the, it, it's interesting because it puts the onus on those folks who might not want to speak about it to, to do it. So I, again, we're just, we're just suggesting this. We're a community board. We only have the power of suggestion and advice. But even so, the wording of it seems like we have, we're, we're throwing uh, a lot at a lot of the different elected officials where we should narrow that down to at least maybe a council member, people involved with the city land use process. Can, can I can I can I quickly respond, Dan? I, I I appreciate what you're saying. I mean, I, I think that there are, there are two things here. One is I think the community board has the power of political pressure, and it can make statements that are designed to politically pressure a city agencies to take action and elected officials to take action. Obviously, the, the community board cannot stop EDC from doing anything, but it can register a public statement that we think it should do something and we think our elected officials should do something and then that that statement can be ignored by edc and ignored by the elected officials but at least the statement has been registered and has been made publicly and i would just say about the elected officials chosen um i, I have never heard jerry nadler who represents the entire waterfront in in the five years that i've been paying attention to the community board i've never heard him speak to this community board about about local projects uh, Diane Savino, I've never heard her speak about local projects to this community board, but she did endorse the Steiner Studios project and she submitted uh, a, a letter of support to Steiner's specific bid to the, e to, to the EDC. So an uh, elected official was privately endorsing a particular company on a particular project, even though that elected official never spoke to this board. And I just don't think that's okay. I think we need to make a stand and we need to say to our elected officials, we expect you to speak to this community, especially if behind the scenes you are fully aware of projects and may in fact be endorsing them. And according to EDC, all of the elected officials, with the possible exception of Diane Savino, are aware of Eastern Effects, but they've never spoken to us about that. And again, these are just recommendations, but I think the board should use its power of political pressure to make that statement. So what I so, so I find it's, it's just it's a matter of wording. And what I but what I'm hearing is that we that the community board's position that we resolved that major leases or is it is it is there is there a, is, is there like a, a, a like a, a small space lease that we have to hear from every elected official for is it, should we just say major leases should should have uh elected officials weigh in on them if they're if EDC, elected officials should comment on the leases signed by edc for major tenants I and mean, that's that's what I'm hearing. I I mean I I well well we we no, never we well, it's just that we have to di differentiate between between everything they do and 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 the, the stuff that really matters. We have to pick our battles. I want to go to want to go to Nick as yeah. and see the rush on this. Nick. So I I think a little bit you know the cow's kind of out of the barn a little bit on this one. However, I, I think really you know the meat and potatoes of the resolution is trying to get you know, EDC to be more open about what they're doing before they're going to do it. Because a lot of times, like everything else that happens in this neighborhood, we find out when it's happening. So I, I think that's really where we're trying to get to. And then secondly, you know, to John's point, you know, a lot of the elected officials will make a backdoor deal and then we find out about it later, or, you know, maybe somebody wasn't contacted. So I don't know if there's a way that you can generically word something like this. However, I, I think it's already too late for the projects they're talking about. If they're already been permitted and everything's already happening, uh, again, we're already like, you know, six months to two years behind the curve on this, despite everyone's best efforts. So, so sorry, just before I go to you, Cindy. So, 
maybe something like, maybe we can resolve that elected officials, uh, an elected, that, that elected officials are informed and, can, and are, are allowed to comment or allowed to, or, or, we, or we could just ask elected officials that EDC have formed elected officials, pertinent elected officials, and we could throw Jerry, Le Jer uh, Jerry Nadler in there as well. He's gonna be, if he, you know, Jerry Nadler doesn't represent a soul in Sunset Park. That's, I mean, that's, I, I keep pointing that out. He represents, he literally represents bulkheads. So, um, but if we, if we can uh, resolve that EDC should inform elected officials, and that elected officials comment. So at least we know elected officials, that the elected officials know. Well, I, I think I'd go a step further, which is, you know, again, I'd like to put the onus on EDC to basically have to comment on this, considering you'll get a comment out of the EDC eventually, you know, whether it's via a FOIL request or whatever you want to do versus, you know, a politician can, you know, speak out of any which way they want to. So you could have the EDC have to report back that they did speak to the representative and then also report back what the re representative's opinion was. I know that gets into hearsay and things like that, but then at least you'd get an answer out. Yeah, but it also could be just form like, like formal, like their official opinions. They might, look, are you, we can allow elected officials to talk in, in, in the hallway to each other or, or agencies because that's what they do. Yeah. But uh, when they come out and they say, yeah, we're, we're for this because or we're not for this because that's what we're asking for. And that's fine. I think that's that 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 resolution makes sense. The second part of your resolution is pretty much boilerplate, John. I mean, it's just and, and we can throw that in as well. Just to talk about the first the first part. Cindy. You're on mute. Yeah, so um, I think most of the people on the call know this, but I do have a conflict of interest, so I won't be able to vote on this um, since my company um, has a permit um, and works with the EDC. However, I did want to say one thing, um, which is the not, and this is just sort of like backing up what Dan uh, already brought up, um, which is the issue of, of not approving any contracts. I mean, some of these contracts are with local business garment businesses in the district like we don't want that to be damaging to like some of the small businesses that are that are in the process and have gone through this whole I mean in a way it, it is kind of like the cows are out of the barn so I just don't know that is there like a dollar amount uh in terms of is is there some threshold where we can define what size what, what we're re referring to here, that's all. So I just don't want this to come across as like the community board personally, and of course I'm not going to vote on this, but coming across as if the community board is taking a position that could be damaging to, or, or perceived as, as, as potentially damaging to some of the local businesses in the district that are hoping to get these leases. Um, and, and so, yeah, so that's, you know, I understand the spirit of it, but I, I just sort of question if, um, we should state that we are, we don't want any Nick, contracts to be approved. I have a question. Nick, I have an answer for you. I would recommend something along the lines of about 50,000 square feet. Um, that usually would equate to something major, or you could also put in another caveat where um, if a series of leases were, you know, done in batch or bulk to equate to 50,000 square feet in a certain time frame, that would probably work, say within two months or something. You know, this is kind of in the spirit of, of you know, Industry City was talking about, and before that, Salmar, you know, 12 years ago, uh, got us to increase their retail space. And so we basically said, we have a, we have a number in mind. Um, that, sounds, that sounds good. John, what do you think of that? I would, I would certainly rather pass a resolution than not pass a resolution. So I'm going to be flexible, but I just, I just want to, to, to restate my point here. It, it's not, it's not to ask the community board to micromanage or to have some sort of veto power over leases of, of different kinds. It's, it's a, it's a principled statement. The simple reality, as I can understand it, is that the made in New York campus was, was this, it's the city picking industries to support. Steiner Studios is getting 650,000 square feet at 11 cents per square feet, per square foot. That was a decision that our city government made. The community was not involved in that decision. 
and the uh, elected officials were not involved in that decision. And the only reason we have that number is because of FOIL requests. This community board was never given the rent that Steiner will be paying. Now on Made in New York campus, same thing. It is the city making a decision. These are government officials with public money on public land making a decision about what industry is to support. The point of this resolution, the, 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 the idea that they would come before this community and they would comment on in detail on what's going on and that all of our elected officials, what I'm looking for is a general comment. I'm looking for our elected officials to say, we support this use. And we think this use and the contracts that will stem from this use will be good for this community for the following reasons. It's not to ask elected officials to pick and choose a company here, a company there. I would love to support local businesses, and but, but it's asking for some public control over a city decision to pick an industry to support. And that is what the city did at this campus. It's what it's doing at Brooklyn Army Terminal. It's what it's doing at SBMT. And in all of those cases, in my opinion, there is a remarkable lack of public transparency and public involvement in, in, in who the city is choosing to empower and who the city, what the city is choosing to do with these spaces. So that's, that's the big picture goal of this resolution. Okay, I'm going to go back to Cindy, and then we're going to go, and then we're going to, we're going to have an open discussion and decide if we're going to, if we're going to vote on this. We might, and, and if you, whether you're, if, you, if you're thinking about this resolution, but you have some issues with it, think about friendly amendments right now that we could put in before it's resolved. And it goes to either the full community board in September, which I think would be, which would be fine because I don't think it would affect anything. There's nothing time sensitive about this right now. Or we could put out a provisional, provisional resolution if the chair wants to sign it, uh, if Cesar wants to sign it before then. Um, but either way, uh, we've got some time, so I think we should we can discuss some of this now and then see what a resolution looks like before, when the full board kind of uh, votes on it. I'm sorry, Cindy, go ahead. Yeah, I just, um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, John. And I, I think like one of the things that I, um, you know, that, that would be helpful is, is being brought into the process a little bit earlier is kind of what you're articulating is that the design of the RFP and like the conceptual stage is where the community really wants to have uh, some kind of voice and engagement um, in, in the decision making around how, how this is how, how this kind of site would be structured. That's, that's kind of what you're speaking to here. Um, and so I just, I just wanted to kind of follow up um, in that spirit um, because my initial reading was like, well, a lot of this is hinging on these individual tenant contracts, whereas the, the bigger point that you're trying to make here is like for projects of the scale, we're looking for a greater voice um, from a structural standpoint earlier on in the process. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure to what extent that, that can have an impact on this project. Um, but certainly something that we could convey like moving forward. Um, I'm just not sure if the carrot is the, the, the like tenant contracts. Um, yeah. I, I just think taking a stand now, making a statement now could give this community greater control over future projects. Even if, even if nothing changes with Made in New York itself with that building A and building C and building B with Eastern Effects, um, and obviously it's very late in the game for things to change, but there are other parts of that campus that if this community says now we need to hear from everybody and we're, we're taking a stand now, I, I hope that we could get structural input in the future. That is the goal as well. Okay. Um, so I'm thinking for, in terms of language, uh, something like in, in, the, in the resolution, something like that, the, that elected officials and the community board be informed of such decisions, such major decisions made on leasing, yada, 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 but have it 30 days before it goes to the board of EDC. Because the board is gonna vote, like we know about, we, we found out, I found out, found out about Eastern uh, today with a lot of you, I think, and the board is gonna vote on it tomorrow of EDC. Um, really what, what they should be, what, what we could, should have is 30 days notice. So that that would give time for the board to maybe call a committee meeting or actually bring it up at the board meeting and come up with a resolution. If we don't like that lease, if they were leasing to somebody else with a noxious use, perhaps, we could say, excuse me, you know, we could write to the EDC board and say, we, we vehemently disagree with the decision 
to lease. And we could send it to every elected official. But if we had that information first and with enough time to maybe affect a decision-making process or to muster some re response from elected officials who may or may not know about it either, I think that's kind of the, the spirit of the, we want in the letter. Am I right, John? That that would definitely be an improvement, but but I, and I will I I would accept that if that's what people want to accept. But but I, again, if we contextualize this, we have a project that was announced four four point five years ago. This is the first presentation to CB seven that is dedicated to this North Campus project. Four point five years later, I don't think EDC should be picking an industry to give. 300,000 square feet, you know, 200,000 square feet to 650,000 square feet to without first having a public engagement process. I, I mean, it just, it shouldn't happen. They, they shouldn't be allowed to simply, not, none of our elected officials have ever said that they were involved in the design of the Made in New York campus at all. In fact, they said the opposite. Councilmember Chapman said he was not informed. Jeremy Lawfer said years ago that CB7 was informed a week before the February 2017 announcement for this immense project uh so yes a 30 30 day window would be great but it's it's i, I feel like the real issue here is why does edc feel despite the, again i am not impugning the integrity of the people who come before this board i i i trust them and i'm consistently highly impressed with them but it is but it is an approach to doing things that itself is is structurally flawed they, they should not be picking industries um, without having some sort of public accountability. I, I'm not saying there has to be some sort of community veto power. So the, the reason I, all this resolution is designed to, to essentially make up for the fact that that never happens. It is, it is designed to say, we're going to have at least one meeting before all of these leases go through with the, with the apparent you know, exclusion of Eastern effects. We're going to have at least one meeting where all the elected officials weigh in and where EDC and the mayor's office, critically the mayor's office, are there to answer questions. And then that, I think, sets a tone that can be used going forward, um, where EDC will not just pick and make a, make a bunch of decisions regarding Pier 6, which is enormous, and then come to us and say, where do you want X or Y? I don't think that's good enough. There, there are other properties. The, the powerhouse is a 50,000 square foot property. The roundhouse is a 50,000 square foot property. Those are substantial properties. So that's that's why I would prefer to say we need at least one meeting where we're going to do the thing that never happened before, and then that will change things going forward. But but if people are not comfortable with that, um, then I would certainly I would certainly support a thirty day notice. I just don't think it I, I don't think it addresses the court the court issue. Thirty day notice is on is on leases on on, on anybody on any the, any decision that the board of EDC has to weigh in on, essentially. You know, with mm -hmm. above a certain criteria, that is, if the EDC board has to weigh in on a, on a leasing of a property, they do, they do it as a matter of formality. We're not interested in that. We're interested in the big stuff. So as long as the resolution applies to the big stuff, that's fine. Nick, you had a, a, another. Uh, I think what you're really looking for is two different tiers of involvement, essentially. So for, you know, leases, you know, after they've already picked the focus or after everyone's picked the focus, I think 30 days is a sufficient amount of time. But I think to John's point, you know, when they're essentially going to go figure out and say, okay, we want to do garment in this area and just plop down the industry because some analyst that works for them says that that's a good idea. I think that's where they're, you know, John is indicating that there should be additional community impact you know, input to that decision. Now, not veto power, but certainly input in those meetings. And that sort of time frame should be, you know, much before that process happens. And I think that's really two separate resolutions just to make it easier. Um, because I think the first one is very much so we haven't really talked about it. And I, I would table that discussion only because I think that's a much larger topic to figure out how we handle. But certainly for the, the issue at hand right now, as it applies to the leases currently being under consideration, especially the larger ones, I think you can impose that particular memo um, and we could probably craft that and get that done tonight. But I think the, hmm. the first one would take much longer to really properly word and send out. Okay, let's do the easy work tonight. Um, so 
what you're talking about is the second part of the resolution, Nick. John, let's can we can we deal with the second part of this resolution? The, so the, the the second part it, it said EDC should work with CB7 and the Sunset Park community to discuss and develop um, future plans for other portions of the North Campus in a public and transparent manner. Yes, um, I think we can get the entire committee to agree on that uh, resolution right now. The other the other resolution is more like it's more like another uh, discussion all about that we'll be amongst ourselves without EDC taking up you know an hour and fifteen minutes of it. I'm like not that was that's what that was the agenda for tonight. But I'm saying for the. For that resolution, we might need to have a, like a, a discussion of committee, a, a long, a longer discussion amongst the committee, and not something from new business. But I'm very happy to uh, advance this the second part of that resolution right now, so that and give it and give it to Cesar to even to even uh, send it before the September meeting, uh, anticipating a vote uh, on in September, which we can do as well, right, Jeremy? We what is it called? Provisional. We lost Jeremy. Nope. You. I was muted. You should speak to the chairperson before making that uh, uh, commitment. Well, um, yeah, I get, but again, it's not. It's not time. So we do that on time sensitive stuff. But um, it, it's not. It's not time sensitive because of uh, what we know right now about the, what they're leasing. Um, we, we we don't know about the leases for the garment. Uh, we 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 it's it, the the pier six and other pier six is the only thing that has funding at this point according to edc but that's not happening immediately but i i it sounded to me like we're unclear on when they're going to move those leases for the garment spaces right um I, so, yeah, you're, so you're proposing you're proposing uh, uh, dan just to do the second part um, but, but in other words, we're, we're dropping, we're dropping the, um, can, can, can we, can we put out, can we put out an ask to our, all of our elected officials? Can we include an ask that, it, you know, so if we're going to eliminate the, you shouldn't approve any leases until, can we, can we include a section in this resolution that says all relevant local elected officials should issue public statements as soon as possible, taking a position on the North campus? So we're just we're asking them officially to yeah, do what they have never done. I think that's fine. I think that's fine. Um, I think it's fine to see. That's actually a second resolution. I think we we, should, we should vote on two two resolutions. The one is the uh, that EDC should be open about plans for the North Campus, and the other is that elected officials. We should just send all the elected officials to please weigh in your opinion on the leasing on the leasing program. EDC's leasing program at the North Campus of Made in New York, Made in New York uh, campus or Bush Terminal. That's fine. Um, so again, let's let's start with the first. One. First one is the second is the second part of your original proposed resolution, right? Can you read yeah, I, yes. So the, it, it states, EDC should work with CB7 and the Sunset Park community to discuss and develop future uh, plans for other portions of the North Campus in a public and transparent manner. By other portions, I meant portions that are not currently planned as part of the North Campus. So I was thinking specifically of Pier 6, the Powerhouse, and the Roundhouse. Those okay. are the three. So we, can, so we can. That's the resolution, and you can you can add the you can add the specifics into the resolution. Um, that okay. is Pier Six. Uh, are there any? Is there any more discussion on that resolution before we vote on it to send it to the, the general board for for uh, acceptance to the general board? I don't see any hands up. Okay. If you, you know how to raise your hand using this Zoom, which I, I think I did, I, I kind of do, raise your hand if you're in favor of the resolution that John just, just brought up. Cynthia, Cynthia's got it. She knows how to raise your hand. Can we possibly do unanimous consent unless there's anybody objects, just trying to speed this up unless there's anybody or? Yeah, and, and if you can just state in the minutes that um, I'm not eligible to vote, but present. Okay, you are voting present. Uh, if I don't see any, I'll tell you what, if anybody, 
If anybody is against the resolution, just speak up, just say no. Go on on mute and say no. Hearing none, uh, I, I believe the committee can say that the resolution passes unanimously out of committee, okay? The second resolution, John, was? Uh, I, had, I had written all relevant local officials, so should issue public statements taking a position on the North Campus project, including Councilperson Carlos Menchaca, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, Representative Nidhi Velasquez, Representative Jerry Nadler, Assemblyperson Marcelo Matena, State Senator Diane Savino, and State Senator Elmer Myrie. Okay, well, just we'll, we could just have that all 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 elected officials, state, city, and federal uh, local officials should comment on the please cut please. Uh, Supreme Court asks that they comment on further leasing at the North Campus. That's that's what it is. So your so your wording is all relevant states. Well, well, well I said relevant. It doesn't have to be relevant. What I'm saying is I'm trying to avoid the listing of every everybody, including dog catcher who, who serves in neighborhood. So I'm just saying every elected official, every local elected official, city, state, and federal, the city, state, and federal level, should comment on leasing at who, who's should comment on leasing at the at the uh, mid New York County. <clears throat> so that will include Velasquez, Nitty, Velasquez, Nadler, Menchaca, Myrie, uh, um, everybody else who I can't remember right now. Okay. So so the so the what I wrote down is every local elected official at the city, state, and federal level should comment on leasing at the Made in New York New York campus? Do we want to say specifically? At the Made in New York, okay. Every local elected official no, at the city. No, 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 not the Made in New York campus. On all major leases the EDC enters into. Uh, it allows uh, the park waterfront. Um, well, but that, but, but now we're getting back to the same problem where, where the, the, the goal of this resolution is to, is to get the elected officials to be talking to the public before these decisions are made, it, not, not in a post facto capacity. Yeah. At, and especially considering that multiple elected officials have, have, uh, you know, put out press releases supporting these projects, even though they never talk to the community about the projects. Well, uh, well, well, that's, that's a statement. We have to put out a statement. That's what I'm, that's what we're asking. What? Well, well, I, I'm I'm thinking of something. I'm thinking of something focused right now, which is which was just on the North Campus itself, recognizing that leases are coming down the pipe, recognizing that a new lease will be signed tomorrow by the board, and then further leases are planned in the in the ensuing months. Can we ask all of the elected officials to begin to go on the record about the North Campus as soon as possible? And then we can have a larger conversation about how we want them interacting with the community in the future. We, we will just ask for public statements from from all elected officials on the on the leasing program at the North Campus. On the leasing program, uh, on the North Campus, um, North Campus. Uh, can I add as soon as possible? Yes. So, so I now wrote down every local elected official at the city, state, and federal level should comment on the leasing program for the North Camp for the Made in New York North Campus as soon as possible. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, are there, is there any discussion on that resolution? Is there anybody against that resolution? Please speak up or just raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, I am going to say that we are unanimously passing the resolution asking for elected officials to comment and publicly express their, their, uh, their wishes on the, the further leasing of the, of the leasing program EDC has at the, new, at the, at the Made in New York North Campus. Okay, so we got two resolutions coming out of committee. Is there anything else in new business or old business? I just have one more thing, and I appreciate the time that you dedicated to these resolutions, but I can defer to Cindy. Why don't, Cindy, why don't you go ahead? Oh, I was just going to say that um, for the fall, I do want to, I'm, I'm going to help get a meeting set up um, 
on the topic of workforce development and inclusion of people with disabilities. So thanks, Cindy. That's that's coming this fall. It's just taking some time to reach out to people. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for picking that up. The only other thing I wanted to ask is if there was interest in the committee to establish an email list so that we can uh, in contact each other and email ideas to each other about future committee meetings um, and also potentially allow the public to contact the committee. And that can be done using Google Groups, which is a free, a free service. I would just really like to try to encourage conversations about, about, among other things, about the agenda for future meetings, but also just issues in general. Uh, so do me a favor, just reach out to individual members of you, you have you have access to all members of the committee. Uh, I, I, I don't. I would have to go through Jeremy Woffer. I would have to ask him to pass along an email. So, so should I do that? I'm not quite sure if, you, if that's if that, is that the case for committee members? That is I cannot legally give out people's personal email addresses without them giving me the go ahead to do so. Well, then and most of these are private email addresses. Yeah. So, John, just uh, send it through Jeremy and then see who's going to respond. Join the Google group. I'll, I'll send a proposal to Jeremy that he could forward to other to okay. other committee members. This is an individual. This is a, these are decisions that should be made on individual basis. OK, any other new business or old business? Cindy, your hand is not up anymore, is it? Okay. Okay, guys, thanks for a great spirited meeting. I, a lot came out of it, a lot of information and a lot of feedback to EDC and we're going forward with a couple of resolutions. I appreciate this. Guys, if I don't see uh, a lot of you, have a great summer. Uh, I'll probably see most of you. John, I'll see you somewhere on Fifth Avenue walking around. Um, Looking forward to it, thank you. All right, guys, be well, thanks a lot. Good night, Bye, everyone. Have a great summer. Have a great summer. Thanks so much. Bye.